Hi, and welcome to this workshop on rebuilding face-to-face -face relationships with students after emergency remote teaching. I'm Caroline Unning, and I will lead you through this presentation. So I will start here with my sharing my PowerPoint, my screen here. Here's my name, Carleen Unning. I'm an instructional designer with Elite at Montgomery College. So this is not of concern to you right now. This is a sign-up sheet for the people who were doing it when I did it the first time, when I was live. This now is a recording. So this is what I'd like to achieve uh, with our workshop, that at the end of this workshop, you'll be able to to um, you know, articulate some things, some thoughts about your teaching strategies once the student come, come back to your class and once you're back face to face with students. So during this workshop, hopefully you can categorize these thoughts uh, in strategies that are related to restoring pre-pandemic teaching practices or and or to strategies that may be evolved and may be transformed from before the pandemic to after the pandemic or when we're face to face with students again. So that's my learning outcomes. So let's start here with making connections. So I want you to take just a minute and or maybe not even a minute and to brainstorm some words that come to mind immediately when you uh, think of meeting the students again, rebuilding that relationship. Just one word and you can write it down on a piece of paper or obviously not doing the chat box here, but you can write it down on a piece of paper just for yourself, no right and wrong or wrong, just to make that connection. This is a strategy that I always use in my teaching to have, to have participants make connections between the new information that I'm going to share and the experiences they already have in that area, because that's how we learn. We learn by making connections to existing knowledge. So please write down a couple of words that come to your mind, one word, when you think about that time while you're preparing for seeing the students face to face again. So I'm gonna um, base this uh, presentation on an article. It's actually a blog from the teaching professor and it's called Teaching Lessons from the Pandemic, What to Keep and What to Leave Way Behind. So the first thing to leave way behind, according to the authors, is the Lone Ranger learner. Now the Lone Ranger, that's a reference to an American icon, uh, in the Western that was on TV in the 1950s of this lone cowboy who, um, you know, who, who went around writing wrongs um, and he had his partner uh, being a, a Native American who, uh, so the two of them um, went around, it's kind of like a Robin Hood kind of situation. So the Lone Ranger, what they mean here, of course, if you understand that cultural reference is of uh, the learner who just fully learns individually on their own. So with the remote emergency remote teaching, of course, students were forced to be alone and to, to um, learn on their own in combination, of course, with the, with the Zoom meetings that they had with their professor or the lectures that the professor uh, forwarded through Zoom. So because of the need for masking and the social distancing, even if there were students that wanted to learn together, that was a difficult thing. There was definitely an obstacle for doing that because of the pandemic. So what happens is, what happened is that students were more or less forced to learn instead of in the formal classroom, in the comfort, for some it was comfort, for others it was not, of their home setting. So, you know, you can imagine students 
in their pajamas. They didn't have to dress up for class. Students who did not want to be on camera, which is another topic in itself. You know, do you want to have students or do you force students to have a camera on or off when you have a Zoom meeting? So they were kind of forced to being in this informal setting uh, while learning. So it's only logical that they became what the authors call the Lone Ranger learner. So, but that's what we want to get rid of. So here in this slide, you see, we want to swab the Lone Ranger learner for the um, collaborative learning. Study after study show that shows that students learn in groups. They learn from each other, with each other, with the teacher. So better than to continue this individual approach that students were more forced into and that you as an instructor was forced to have, once students come back to face-to-face -to -face classroom, it is important to emphasize, to emphasize the collaborative learner. So starting from day one, you can talk to the students and you can explain that your teaching strategy is one where students interact and collaborate. Two, and you can even mention studies that show that that's the way people learn in groups from each other and with each other. So from day one, you can start establishing that community by students introducing themselves, learning names, you know, doing kind of introductory games. And um, so that way, students realize that that's what they're going to experience. They're going to experience collaborative learning because that's what you as a professor, that's how you teach with collaborative learning techniques. So be explicit about it. It's good for students to think about you know, how they learn, the metacognitive side of learning. So tell them it's the best way to learn and that's what they can expect in your class. There are a lot of different um, collaborative learning techniques. There are workshops on it. You can find a lot on the internet about it. You can find a lot on, at Montgomery College's The Hub. We have a, a lot of resources there. But just for an example, an active learning technique, a collaborative learning technique is think, pair, share. You do a little lecture, you, you, know, you share your content, the new content students need to know. And then after you're done, you ask them to pair up. Well, first you ask them a question about what you just taught. And then you ask them to pair up and discuss their answers with their partner. So it's just a little bit of an exchange. It doesn't have to take long, but a little bit of, of a way to make students collaborate uh, from the very beginning, to collaborate on, on learning the new knowledge that you share. You can do partner quizzes. You can ask students to take quizzes together. You can ask students to take notes together and then compare their notes after a lecture. So those are just a couple examples of what you can do to encourage the collaborative learning. Another aspect to, lay, to leave way behind, according to the authors, is the lazy learner. Now, the lazy learner is a little bit disrespectful to the students, but I think a lot of professors will recognize that the lazy learner even before uh, the pandemic struck. So the lazy learner is the learner that's just not ready to learn. That, you know, is, is for one, is just sitting back supposedly and listening. But, you know, with Zoom, it was very easy to Zoom in, right? To get connected to the lecture and then to tune out by, you know, turning your camera off and, possibly doing other things, possibly multitasking, possibly doing something completely different. So instead of calling the learner lazy, 
it, we can look at it from a, from a positive side and think, you know, understand that a lot of students were not used to distance learning. So they're used to being in a formal classroom where they need to pay attention, where they need to be present, right? So the whole, the whole idea about um, the camera on and off that's something, you know, there's discussions about that, what is good or what is bad, but at least the camera forced the students to be in a somewhat formal classroom setting. But then there were disadvantages to a camera. There were students who just didn't have their own spot in the house and were embarrassed about their house setting, didn't have a quiet place or a, a you know, a, a desk to sit at. So, you know, there's other reasons to keep the camera on off, which not necessarily means that they're the lazy learner. But during the structured remote teaching, most of us didn't do much of anything else than just trying to get the content to the students. So there's no way that we could practice during the, the um, during um, emergency remote teaching. And then, you know, the lazy learners, sometimes we know that of ourselves too, the technology fails. And, you know, that can be true, it could be really the case, but that is also can be used as an excuse for not, you know, tuning in. Um, and, you know, you can't blame the students for that. So leave behind the lazy learner. Instead, swap the lazy learner for the active learner. The active learner is obviously a student that does more than just sitting back and listening to the professor. Now, listening is an activity, of course, but learning does not happen just by listening. Learning happens when the students are doing something with the knowledge that they listen to and that they've heard. So that is active learning. Now, there are a lot of active learning techniques out there as well. And I would encourage you to look into those. Of course, when you want to have this active learning, it means that you as a professor needs to design or create or design and then implement the, the techniques to get the students to be actively engaged. And also you need to coach the students who might not be used to being in an active role in the classroom. You need to guide them through the activities. So, and again, this is something that you can explicitly say from the very first day of your, of your class that you, that's what you expect of students. You expect them to be collaborative and you expect them to be actively engaged. So we have to move away from the just sitting and listening. So, you know, there's a couple of ways that you can encourage the active learning in terms of activities, but also in terms of preparation for class so that the students come to class prepared. Of course, you can give them reading assignments. And I know that's not always easy because a lot of students don't do the reading. But you could, for instance, create in Blackboard, you could create simple quizzes that, um, you know, that cover the, 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 the reading that students are supposed to do before class. And then, you know, give a little couple, it's low stakes, but give a couple of points to those quizzes if they um, are successful in, in, in doing them. And this would make students ready to learn at the beginning of class, these little quizzes. You could also do uh, uh, classroom assessment techniques. These are techniques for formative um, assessment in which, um, you know, simple things like asking students what they already know about a topic, like how I started at the beginning of class or and at, at the end of class, you can ask students, for instance, to write down on a piece of paper, doesn't have to have a name on it. What was the what was the, the the most difficult thing that came up in class today? Where do you need more explanation? Or and or you can ask them what was the most interesting thing that you learned today. So you can do that at the end of class. So you start the class 
with an activity to immediately engage the students, to get the students to do something to be active. And at the end of the class, you kind of help students summarize. And also that's another way to activate the knowledge with these small classroom assessment techniques. There here too, you can look at Montgomery College, the hub for techniques and for suggestions on um, these uh, classroom assessment techniques to get students to be active and ready to learn. Okay, so those were two things according to the authors to leave way behind, as they said, the low ranger learner and the lazy learner. But what are things that we want to continue doing after, and things that we've learned from the emergency remote teaching? So here you see it, it's, I'll go through each one of them. It's that we learned technological tools, we learned to better connect, and we learned to care and understand students better. So to start with the technological tools. So we were all forced, in Montgomery College anyway, to take a course, a structured remote teaching course in using Blackboard. So by doing that, we learned a lot of how to use Blackboard necessarily in the remote classroom, but some things we can continue to use in our face-to-face -face -face classes. So for instance, Blackboard, has quizzes, you can create quizzes, and there's all kinds of, of ways that you can create quizzes, and they, they can be self-graded, they could be graded by you, they could be ungraded, they could, um, you know, um, you can ask students to do it in class, you can ask students to do it after class. There's a lot of apps, computer applications that you can use to make students more engaged in your classroom, like there's Kahoot, there's Jamboard, there is um, Mentimeter, there, to, to name a couple of computer applications that you can incorporate to, um, and that you might have done during the, the emergency remote teaching just to keep students engaged because we weren't in the classroom together. So, and that's, and I'm already talking about the second point here, that's engagement, especially when we are lecturing online, like in Zoom synchronously. So the students are there and we're sharing the knowledge it's nice to break up your lectures with activities to get students engaged, to do something with the knowledge, to, to hold them. So there are a lot of apps out there that you could use for that to encourage engagement. We've also learned technological tools that help us save time. For instance, you know, you, I don't know whether you take time um, taking attendance at the beginning of class, but you could do that easily with a, uh, an Office 365 form, or I'm sure there are other programs too that you can create forms electronically and let your students um, sign in that way. And then you don't have to worry. Actually, even Zoom has the possibility to check uh, attendance because it shows exactly who is online in your Zoom class. So that helps and that saves time. What we also learned from the emergency remote teaching is it provides flexibility. Because we've learned to use Zoom, we've had to use other kinds of ways to, to connect with students. You have learned that there are different ways that students, that you can ask students to learn and to show their learning. learning. You know, virtual labs, flipped classrooms, uh, recorded lectures, um, uh, Zoom sessions in the evening. So there are multiple ways that you can make use of technological tools to make, to give more flexibility to students and more choice. Now remember the, um, the skills that you've learned during remote, emergency remote teaching 
are valuable skills. And I would encourage you to continue to use those skills because, you know, you don't use it, you lose it. And um, so like we have every class has a Blackboard companion site. Every face-to-face -face class has a Blackboard companion site. So use that companion site. Now you know how to use Blackboard because you had to use it, but now use it because it really enhances your teaching. And you know, it's, it's, it's a very nice companion and it's a very nice place to store. It's a very nice place to, to um, have assignments, the syllabus, uh, you know. So use that Blackboard or if you have any other uh, uh, system that your school uses. And also, if you're like me and you're a little hesitant about using technology in your classroom, you've, you've learned how it, there are indeed interesting apps and technologies and Blackboard, how you can use Blackboard. To, to enhance your teaching. And um, so continue to do it. And also maybe look out for new apps that you can use. Listen to your, listen to your or talk to your colleagues to see what they're using to do some classroom activities that are active, collaborative, and use technology. So the tech tools, that is the one area that we've learned and that we want to continue to make use of. The other thing we've, we've learned from um, the emergency remote teaching is caring and understanding for our students. It was in our school, it was very much emphasized that we should be understanding for the students. We should understand how, how their life is very involved. They have different things going on. A lot of times they are part-time students. A lot of times they have jobs. A lot of times they have families. So, you know, that caring and understanding for the students and for their lives to really see them as a person, you know, in a setting that, you know, may produce stresses. And we all know that stress is not good for learning. Stress inhibits learning. So just, you know, if you are a very strict professor, very strict teacher, maybe think about the human side of your student and, you know, try to see every case of maybe, you know, a late submission, try to, to talk to the students individually and see, understand, and maybe be a little bit more flexible. You know, L.D. Fink is an instructional designer, and he uh, articulated um, different domains for significant learning. And here on the, on the slide, you see the different domains, and one of the domains is caring. So caring is very important in learning. It's a part of learning. Learning how to learn is the first one you see there. That is, um, we talked about that before to, to talk to your students about the, the, the value of collaborative learning, the value of active learning. So for students to realize that, what helps them learn, that is an important part of the whole picture of learning. What else do we continue to use from our emergency as an experience from our emergency remote teaching. We learned early on how important it was in our emergency remote teaching, and maybe in teaching in general, I would say now, is to stay connected to your student and to coach your student through the course more, maybe do a little bit extra. It's not that you're pampering the students, it's that you are guiding them and you're teaching them not only your content, but also how to learn and to stay on task. So, you know, the Blackboard announcements where you might reiterate, hey, tomorrow this assignment is due, quizzes about the syllabus. The syllabus is an important document and, you know, you might want to encourage them to keep looking at that syllabus. And, you know, you might do syllabus quizzes just for fun. 
or maybe low stakes. Maybe you give them a point or so for it, but so that they stay on target. Um, you can, um, the Zoom office hours, Zoom makes it so easy to meet with the student for you and for the students. So, you know, continue that connectedness by using um, Zoom in this case and have that attitude of caring and, you know, really guide students maybe a little bit more than you did before the pandemic because then you keep students organized and you keep yourself organized. So now it's your turn. So let's recap. Let's recap. So what do we want to leave way behind? It's the Lone Ranger learner, the individualist learner, and we want to swap that for the collaborative learner. We want to, um, for the active learning, and we want to get rid of the, um, uh, so hold on just a sec. Let me find, it's the collaborative learner that would be an antidote to the lazy learner and the, um, the lone ranger learning is a collaborative learner and the uh, lazy learner, the active learner. So that's what we want to swap. That's what we want to leave behind and you know, prepare for our face-to-face um, -face classes. Keep in mind when preparing for our face-to-face -face classes. Now we've learned about the technology that we can continue to use it. We learned about the importance of connectedness during the pandemic and definitely that same connectedness makes learning better for students after the pandemic. And the same with the caring and the understanding to see the human, see the human in your students and understand their situation and maybe be a little bit more understanding for obstacles that may come in the way and for stresses. So on that note, I asked you to um, think about what, what do you, after hearing this story, what, what, are, what do you recognize in these stories, in these, um, the things we want to leave way behind and the things we want to continue from remote to do? What do you think about the article? I'm already, I told you, I'm already, I already told you already that the Lone Ranger is kind of like um, a cultural reference that not everybody understands. And we really want to get away from the Eurocentric uh, 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 content and examples. So that's one thing I criticize of this article. So, but, but what do you think of, of this, you know, of these uh, alternatives and the continuation? Is there something else that you want to add to, uh, from your own experience that you want to restore, that you want to evolve into, that you want to transform? So think about that, connect to your own experience here. And then finally, here the ref here's the reference to the article in the teaching professor. And here is also a link to uh, LD Fink, the instructional designer who talks about the different dimensions of significant learning. Very interesting. It tells you all the different areas that are necessary for significant learning for our students. So on that note, I will leave you and thank you for listening to this presentation. And uh, my name is Caroline Unink. You can reach me at caroline.unink at montgomerycollege.edu. So it's my name that you see right here. It's Caroline with an I-E at the dot and then my last name at montgomerycollege.edu if you want to reach me. Thank you very much for your attention. And I am going to stop the share and I am going to end the presentation. Thank you, goodbye.